on Wednesday nights, we have been going through the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. And throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon has been on a quest to figure out how to find happiness in life. And on this quest, he has so far made three stops. He has tried out the hedonistic lifestyle focused on pleasures. He's tried out the workaholic lifestyle focused on productivity. And he's tried out the materialistic lifestyle focused on possessions. But without God, none of any of that could make him truly happy. And so, so far, the book of Ecclesiastes has been all negativity. Because up until this point, Solomon has only been trying out the strategies that don't work in life. And so I know that these last couple of chapters have been painful. But I want to encourage you that that pain is actually for our benefit. Solomon has been exposing all the lies, the lies that people believe. Solomon has been exposing all the paths that don't lead to happiness. It's a little bit like a psychologist who is showing their patients that the delusions they believe about reality aren't really real. It's a little bit like a doctor who cuts open the wound and exposes the infection. It's a little bit like a home inspector who points out the faulty foundation. None of those are pleasant at the time, but they benefit us in the long run. And Solomon, throughout his book, is making a multi-stage argument of which we've only seen the first stage so far. And so, so far, it's been a pretty negative book. But tonight, finally, we're going to get some positivity. So you guys have waited long, and you'll be rewarded this evening. Throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon comes up and down like a whale. A well spends most of its time underwater, but every once in a while, the well comes up to surface and comes up briefly for air. Solomon spends most of his book under the surface, looking at life under the sun. But occasionally throughout the book, he surfaces and comes up for air and gets God's perspective on life. And tonight, we're going to see one of those times where Solomon comes up for air. Now, Solomon's visit to the surface tonight is going to be very brief. It's only going to be three verses long. And so there's only three verses of positivity in this whole chapter. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the whole sermon on these three verses because you guys have earned it. You guys have been through three sermons of Solomon hating life so far. And so I'm really going to slow down and focus on one of the passages where he talks about how to enjoy life and how to enjoy life to the fullest. So, let's take a look together at Ecclesiastes chapter 2, starting in verse 24. Solomon says, Nothing is better for a man than that he should eat and drink, and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. Solomon tells us that the best thing for us to do while we are living life under the sun is to try to enjoy life as much as possible. Well, that sounds great, Solomon, but... Wait a minute, didn't Solomon try all of that already? Hasn't he been telling us for two chapters that all of that is vanity and that doesn't work? Well, yes, he has. But he was telling us that when he left God out of the equation of life. Now, he's finally going to bring back God into consideration. And when you bring God back into the equation of life, then it finally becomes possible to enjoy life. In fact, look what he says at the second half of verse 24. Solomon says, this also I saw was from the hand of God. This is the main point of this passage. This is the main point of this chapter. This is the main point of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. That what we're looking for in life, all the happiness and purpose and direction and satisfaction we're looking for only comes from the hands of God. So happiness comes from God, not from the things of this world. Happiness can't be found under the sun because we live in a broken world. Happiness has to be given to us from the one who lives above the sun. Happiness can't be found in this life. It has to be given to us from the giver of life. Or as Tommy Nelson says, man can find nothing in this finite life that can bring infinite peace. You see, happiness is not found in a bar or in a classroom, or on a beach in the Bahamas, or sitting in the CEO's chair at the top of a skyscraper. You can't find happiness in a strip club, 
or in a marijuana dispensary, or at the top of an award podium. David Gibson says that happiness does not come in the box with your iPhone. If it did, why have you been considering that upgrade? It's not on the key ring to your dream house. It's not in the glove box of your new car. You see, happiness is not something we can work for. It's not even something we can sin for. It's something we have to ask for. Happiness is a free gift that has to be given to us by God. Now, Solomon found out this truth the hard way. Look with me in verse 25. Solomon says, For who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? Solomon assures us that he knows what he's talking about because he is the expert on how unsatisfying life under the sun really can be without God. After all, he had tried out everything that this world has to offer. Solomon had more access to money, wealth, and sensual pleasures than pretty much anyone. And yet, even after he'd put all of his power and wealth into his quest, he had still come up short. He was still unable to find happiness when he was only looking for happiness in this world under the sun. And so, he finally came to the conclusion that happiness is not to be found in this world, that happiness has to be handed down to us from above. Now, How do you receive this gift from God? How do you receive this happiness that only God can give you? Well, it starts by believing that there is a God and that this God is above us and that there is more than just this world. And once we believe that, then we can start seeing life from God's perspective, from an above-the-sun perspective. And perspective changes everything. Let me show you a, a picture of a tapestry. So here we have a picture of a tapestry, And these are the two sides of the tapestry. This is obviously the front side, and this is the back side of the tapestry. And what you think about this tapestry depends on your perspective, right? If you're looking at the back side of the tapestry, you're probably going to think that it's not a very nice tapestry, that it's not worth much and not very valuable. You're not going to be able to enjoy it. But then, once we change our perspective and look at the front side of the tapestry, then we can finally recognize its true value. Solomon had been looking at life with the wrong perspective, but now he finally changed perspective. When we look at life from only the undersun perspective, it's kind of like the backside of a tapestry. It's just a bunch of confusing, tangled knots, and it doesn't really seem very valuable or meaningful at all. But once we start viewing life from the correct perspective, the above the sun perspective, then all of a sudden, life changes in our eyes and we can start to begin to see its value and start to appreciate it. Time Magazine uh, published a a paragraph that I want to read to you. I'm going to put it on the screen. Now, keep in mind, Time Magazine is not a Christian publication, all right? They're not super Christian friendly. But here's what they wrote. They said, Study after study has found that religious people tend to be less depressed and less anxious than non-believers better able to handle the disappointments of life than non-believers. A 2015 study by researchers at the London School of Economics and the Erasmus University Medical Center in the Netherlands found that participating in a religious organization was the only social activity associated with sustained happiness. Even more than volunteering for a charity, taking educational courses, or participating in a political or community organization. And then watch this verse. I love this. Are you ready? This is Time Magazine. Here we go. It's as if a sense of spirituality in an active social religious practice were an effective vaccine against the virus of unhappiness. Hmm. Amen. Time, time can get it right every once in a while, right? All right. So does, this sound, does their conclusion sound familiar? It's the same exact conclusion that Solomon had come to. That the more of God we have, the happier we can be. Now, the funny thing is that the more that God is at the center of our life, the more we're actually able to enjoy those things that are at the fringes of life. It's kind of like a package deal. When we have God, we can enjoy God and the gifts that God gives us. When we don't have God, Not only can we not enjoy God, but we can't even enjoy the things that he's created. Because God 
is the missing ingredient that, in, that enables us to enjoy life. My wife is an expert baker. She is a just master at baking all sorts of desserts. And one of her greatest accomplishments are her cookies that she bakes. In fact, I know that there's probably more than one person in here who's had some of my wife's amazing cookies. And what, she's made so many cookies in her life that she doesn't have to look at the recipe anymore. So one day, she was making some cookies, and she was kind of on autopilot, and she wasn't really paying attention, and she was whooping these cookies together, tossing in ingredients, and then she baked the cookies, and she pulled them out and let them cool. And after they'd cooled, she took a bite of it, and she went, oh, she said, there's something wrong with these cookies. And she thought about it, and she realized that she had left out an ingredient. In fact, she had left out the most important ingredient. What's the most important ingredient? Sugar. All right, she had left out sugar. So now, think about it. You're just eating a mouthful of flour, egg, and salt. That doesn't taste good, right? And so she realized it didn't taste good because there was a very important missing ingredient. Solomon had been living a life in which he had left the most important ingredient out. God. God is the missing ingredient that finally helps life to taste sweet. Life is sort of like getting a brand new Ferrari. Let's say you get a brand new Ferrari, but you don't get the keys with it. So it's just sitting there doing a whole bunch of nothing. In fact, it's kind of just frustrating you and sort of taunting you. But as soon as you have the key, now you can finally get moving and actually go somewhere. Now that you have the key, you can finally enjoy the Ferrari and kind of have some real fun with it, right? Well, God is the key that finally gets life moving. He's the key that finally enables us to get somewhere in life. He's the key that finally enables us to enjoy life and to really have some fun. Life is a little bit like table salt. Table salt is made up of two elements, chlorine and sodium. And chlorine by itself is nasty and actually poisonous. It would kill you if you drank enough of it. But once you add sodium to the chlorine, then all of a sudden it becomes something tasty and something that preserves life. Well, Solomon was living life without God. And living life without God is like trying to drink a jug of chlorine all by itself without the sodium. But once he added God back into the equation, then all of a sudden life became something tasty, something that was, was life-giving. I want to, in a second, do a little demonstration. In fact, you've probably been wondering what all this is. I like to sort of have this stuff up here just to tantalize you and make you wonder what in the world's happening tonight. But life is, is a little bit like something that needs a catalyst. What's a catalyst? A catalyst is a substance that ignites a chemical reaction. And so a lot of people are trying to live life without the catalyst. And they're trying to make sense of life with just the ingredients we have, but they're missing something. And so I want to invite Pastor Ty Barksdale, there he is, to come up on stage. Uh, Pastor Ty, like myself, received a biology degree from the uh, Cal State University Bakersfield, but Ty's degree was a little more advanced, and Ty actually ended up using it in his career. I've never ended up really using my degree in any of that, of that way. And so I've asked him to uh, demonstrate what a difference. <laughs> Professor Ty, you can tell he's done this before, right? So I've asked Ty to help us. Let me move the expensive electrical equipment out of the way. Um, to help show us what a difference it makes when we actually have the catalyst. So here, Professor Ty, once he has all his safety gear on, in fact, I better step back a little bit. <laughs> what he's going to do is he's going to put some chemicals. Well, let's see, are you going to put them at the same time in there? Uh, what, well, yeah, I'm going to Okay, some of so let's say it this way. Right now, we have some boring chemicals sitting in this container, right? And right now, these chemicals are doing a whole bunch of nothing. Nothing exciting. But in just a moment, once we add the catalyst, we're going to see what can happen when you get a catalyst going. You got it, Ty. No pressure. All you got to do is get a glove on. All right, we're rocking. Here we go. <laughs> Aha, there they are. Why didn't Ty bring me any? He didn't warn me to bring any safety glasses. What's going on here? This is like Bill Nye the science guy. Here we go. Ah. Do not try this at home, by the way. Any kids watching at home, don't do this.
all right. The anticipation has been building, and now the moment we have all been waiting for. <laughs> Ty's liking the drama. Here we go. We got one bubble. There we go. Something's happening. Something is. There we go. All right. A volcano of excitement. Check it out. All right. Thank you, Professor Ty. Wow, I don't know. Is that thing going to be going on the whole time I'm preaching? Maybe it is. Good job, Ty. I warned Ty. I said, if we have to pick between too much reaction and a little on the lower end, let's pick a little on the lower end, because I don't want to be responsible for stains on the ceiling. So there it is. All right. So before we put the catalyst in, we had a bunch of boring chemicals doing a whole bunch of nothing. All of a sudden, when we put the catalyst in, it came to life, right? Well, that's sort of what life is like. That if we are trying to make something happen with only the ingredients that are present in this life, it's boring. A whole bunch of nothing happens. But the key is to add something into this life from outside of the beaker, from above the sun, to bring God into this life. And when we do that, then all of a sudden life becomes alive. Once we bring God back into the equation... Not only do we get to enjoy God, but all of a sudden it becomes possible to enjoy the other parts of life as well. In fact, Solomon points out in verse 24 that it's only when we have God that we can enjoy the simple pleasures of life like eating and drinking. Without God, even delicious food is frustrating because food doesn't last. I mean, is there anything that satisfies less than food? I mean, you think about it, at best, the pleasure of food lasts maybe a couple hours, perhaps. And no matter how much of it we eat, we quickly get hungry again. I mean, when you think about it, just a couple of hours. All that money, all that time, all that work, all those clogged arteries, for what? A measly couple of hours. And the truth is that most of us start thinking about our next meal before, you know, that two hours is even up. What do we do? As soon as we're done with breakfast, what do we start thinking about? Lunch. As soon as we're done with lunch, what do we start thinking about? Dinner. As soon as we're done with dinner, what do we start thinking about? Dessert. As soon as we're done with dessert, what do we start thinking about? Breakfast, all right? And some of us don't even make it to breakfast. We have to stop and get a midnight snack, right, because we couldn't even make it to breakfast. And the truth is, sometimes, I don't know, this has happened to me. Has this ever happened to you? That sometimes it's in the act of eating one meal that I'm already dreaming about what I'm going to eat the next meal. Have you ever done this? Why do we do that kind of stuff? Why do we have to eat four, six, ten times a day every single day of our life? Well, because food can never really fill us up. Food can never really satisfy. Without God, food can never make us truly happy. If food is what we're looking for to get happiness, we're always going to be let down. We think that the more of it we eat, the happier we'll become. But that's not right. Actually, the more food you eat, the less you enjoy it. Have you ever noticed that? The more food we eat, the more health problems we cause ourselves. The more food we eat, the quicker we eat ourselves into an early grave. But when we bring God into the equation of food, then it makes it possible to really enjoy food because all of a sudden, we now have realistic expectations of what the limits are of what food can really do for us. You see, food is limited. Food cannot give us a lifetime of happiness. At most, it can give us a few minutes of fun. And you know what? What Solomon is saying is that we should enjoy those few minutes of fun, and we should be thankful to God because of them. After all, it's God who made our tongue with the ability to taste. It's God who created all those delicious plants and animals that we love to eat, right? It's God who gave us the ability to make the money to buy the food. And once we have God's perspective... Then we have the proper perspective of knowing that life is more than food. And that way, we don't suffer disappointment when we finally realize how short-lived the pleasure of food really is. On the other hand, there is a sense that once we bring God into the equation, all of a sudden food becomes more meaningful and actually more significant. Because once we have God in our perspective and once we have God in our life, 
then every time we eat some food, it should be a reminder of how much God loves us and how much he takes care of us. I want to challenge you for the rest of your life that every time you're eating, to think about every bite as God saying, I love you, I care about you, I'm going to take care of you. And when we start doing that, then all of a sudden a meal can become a worship service. Have you ever had that happen? Have you ever been eating a meal that's so delicious that you start like praising God? Like, wow, God, you're amazing that you made this. I remember one time um, we went to a a worship concert with some of our friends. And um, before we went to the concert, we stopped at my wife and I's favorite restaurant uh, probably on planet Earth. And that's called the Japanese Kitchen in Clovis, California. And so it's Toppenyaki. You know, that's where they, the Japanese food, where they do all the tricks and stuff in front of you. And I could take or leave the tricks, but I love the food. And so all of us decided we were going to go to this, uh, this worship concert. But before we did, we were going to, um, you know, go eat dinner at our favorite restaurant. So we did. And boy, it was good. And the whole time, I was just thinking, this is so good. And I'd actually been reading the book of Ecclesiastes at the time. And so I was very sort of, it was present on my mind that food can be an opportunity for us to be grateful to God and to worship him. And so the whole time I was just thinking, God, you're amazing. Thank you so much for this. And then we went to the worship concert, and the worship concert was amazing, and we worshiped God. And so afterwards, um, I said, man, this was a great night. We had two worship services tonight. We had the dinner, and then we had the worship concert afterwards. And that's the beauty of the book of Ecclesiastes is that it lets us know that once God is in the equation, that we can enjoy even the smallest parts of life, and that even the smallest parts of life can be an opportunity for us to appreciate and to worship God. And so, not only does Solomon show us that it's only when we have God that we can enjoy the simple pleasures of life like eating, but Solomon also shows us that it's only when we have God that we can actually take pleasure in our work in life. But wait a minute, didn't Solomon just spend like two chapters saying that work wasn't the way to find happiness? Yes, that's what he was saying. But that's when he was considering work without God. Without God, work is meaningless. It's pointless. Without God, work is a whole bunch of nothing, or as Solomon would say it, a whole bunch of vanity. But once we enter God back into the equation, then all of a sudden, all work becomes meaningful. Once we believe in Jesus, we can finally see the truth about reality, that the things we do really do matter, and that our work in life really is valuable. And Solomon says that this also is from God. How does it work? How does seeing life from God's perspective help us to realize how valuable our work in life really is? How does having this above-the-sun perspective help us to realize that we can actually enjoy our work? Well, let me give you a couple ways that having God's perspective can help you understand how important your work is in life, whatever your work is in life. First of all, when we bring God into the equation of life, then work becomes just one more thing to thank him for. And why is that important? Well, because gratefulness is one of the keys to happiness. Grateful people are happy people. Another reason is because when we bring God into the equation of life, then we realize that work is one of the reasons we exist. Work is one of the things that God created us for. The Bible teaches that all of us were created in God's image. And that doesn't mean that we were created to physically look like God. It means that there are some ways in which we were created to be a little bit like God. And one of the ways that we were created to be a little bit like God is work. The Bible says God works, and since we were created in his image, we work as well. In fact, look with me at Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. This is a pivotal passage in the entire Bible. Genesis 1, 27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. So this is the classic verse on God creating us in his image. And then notice what the very next verse is. Verse 28. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. 
right after God created man in his own image, mankind in his own image, then the next thing God does is he gives mankind the first two commandments. These are the first two commandments in the Bible. And what were the first two commandments given to mankind? Have families and work. And so once we understand this perspective, then that means when we're working, we're not just working. We are obeying God. When we're working, we're not just working. We are expressing the image of God within us. Here's another way that God's perspective helps us to enjoy our work, is that when we bring God into the equation of life, then we realize that no work is a waste when it is done for Jesus. Look with me at one of my favorite passages in the Bible. This is Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 23. Paul says, and whatever you do, whatever is raising kids, cooking dinner, tuning a piano, selling tires, preaching a sermon, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve who? The Lord Christ. This above the sun perspective reminds us that when we're working, we're not ultimately working for our boss. We're not ultimately working for our customers. We're not even ultimately working for a paycheck. That when we are working, we're ultimately working to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as if he was our boss. Another way that the above the sun perspective helps us to enjoy life is when we bring God into the equation of life, then we realize that our work is an opportunity to shine our light. Just uh, recently, I was having lunch with a man from our church, and I asked him, like I often do, how did you become a Christian? And he said, well, my boss led me to the Lord at work. Let me ask you, don't you think you would be more excited about going to work if work was a place where you were leading people to Christ? Evangelism can help transform work from the great frustration to an opportunity for the Great Commission. Another way that the above-the-sun perspective can help us enjoy work is that when we bring God into the equation of life, then we realize that work is a way for us to bless other people, both with the service that we provide, but also with the money that we make at that job. I know Christian businessmen in our church who are excited about going to church, or to church, excited about going to work each day because they're excited about all the ways that they can use their profit to serve God and to serve other people. And I know what you're thinking. You're making that up, Brian. That doesn't really exist. I mean, there aren't really people who are going to work every day just so excited about how they're going to bless other people with the money they make, but there are. I know these people, and I'm thinking of them right now within our church, who their passion of going to work is how they're going to be able to make money that they then can bless the Lord, bless the ministry, bless other people with. Now, let's look at the last verse in this passage, verse 26 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Solomon says, For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight, but to the sinner... He gives, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Solomon says that God is the one who gives wisdom and knowledge and joy. Solomon says God gives. These two verses, these two words, are the moral of Solomon's story. What's the point of his book? God gives. God is the one who gives the things that we're looking for so desperately in life. Now notice, this verse doesn't say that life gives. It doesn't say that sensual pleasures give. It doesn't say that work gives. It doesn't say that possessions give. It says that God gives. All the stuff in this life can't bring us happiness until God gives us the ability to actually enjoy it. And that's a gift we receive once we believe in God and start looking at things from his above-the-sun perspective. Now, in this passage, Solomon says that God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. Now, wait a minute. I thought no one was good. What, is it, what does Solomon mean by saying a man who is good in God's sight? Is Solomon teaching some sort of 
works-based salvation? No, he's not. There is only one way to become good in God's sight, and that is by believing in Jesus Christ. But I think what's helpful, to under, uh, helpful for us to understand is that there is a difference between positional righteousness and practical righteousness. Positional righteousness is something that is given to us the moment we believe in Jesus. When you believe in Jesus, you now become righteous in God's sight. And what that means is that from then on, when God looks at us believers, he no longer sees our sins. Instead, he sees Jesus' righteousness that we are clothed in. But that positional righteousness that we receive by faith is supposed to result in more and more actual practical righteousness within our daily lives. So, who is this person that Solomon is talking about who is good in God's sight? I think they are the person who has become positionally righteous by faith and who is proving that faith by practical righteousness within their daily life. Then at the end of this verse, Solomon says, but to the sinner, he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give it to one who is good before God. When we look at life under the sun, it often looks like unbelievers are winning. But one of the reasons that we can enjoy life even when it looks like unbelievers are winning is because we know that in the end, there's going to be a great reversal. That in the end, when Jesus comes back, he's going to turn everything upside down. Jesus said that the meek will inherit the earth. Jesus said that all he owns will one day be ours. The Bible says that we are co-heirs with Christ. So here's a deep implication of all this. Are you ready? Here we go. Tune back in for this. You're going to love it. Having faith not only allows us to enjoy the things of this life when we have them, but it also allows us to enjoy life when we don't have them. You see, us believers don't have to have all the things of this world to be happy. Why not? Because we know that one day we're going to inherit the whole world itself. Didn't Jesus say, the meek shall inherit the earth? And Solomon says that this too is grasping for the wind. What does he mean? He means that the unbeliever's futile attempt to find happiness by amassing the goods of this world will never work. And in the end... Everything that unbelievers work so hard to pile up will actually end up in the hands of those who have belief in Jesus. Now, this is the first time in Solomon's quest that he has come up to the surface. And boy, he didn't stay very long, did he? Just three short verses, right? This is the first ray of light. But as Solomon continues his quest, we're going to find out more and more about how to enjoy life, even though all of us are still living life under the sun. And each time Solomon surfaces throughout this book, he's going to give us a fuller and fuller picture of how to enjoy life and how to find happiness. But it all begins with learning how to see life from God's perspective. Once you know the secret, then you can finally see life truly and clearly. Now, when I was growing up, there was something that became very popular called magic eye pictures. Does anybody remember these magic eye pictures? They seem to take over the world for a few years. I, they were constantly being sold in, um, in malls and things like that. And they were giving millions of people's headache, giving millions of people headaches as they were trying to figure out what was the secret picture. I have, a, I have a picture of one of these magic eye pictures. Does that take you back? That either makes you happy or it sort of like makes you groan remembering how frustrating these things are, right? And so the trick about these magic eye pictures is that you had to know how to see the secret picture in this weird pattern. And so the way I was taught is that you had to get close to it, and then you had to cross your eyes, and then you had to slowly back up and uncross your eyes as you were backing up, and all of a sudden you would see the picture. Now, all this week, I've tried to see the picture of this and have not been able to. Perhaps on a computer screen it doesn't work. I don't know. But anyways, the trick about these magic eye pictures is you had to know the secret in order to see it clearly and to see it correctly, right? Well, it's the same with life. In order to see life clearly, we have to know the secret. And the secret, Solomon says, is having God within our life. In order to enjoy life under the sun, 
We have to look at life through God's above the sun perspective. And so here's my question for all of us tonight. Do we have that kind of perspective? If not, then I want to invite you to believe in Jesus tonight. Because believe me, Jesus makes all the difference in the world. Let me pray for us. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, first of all, that through the book of Ecclesiastes, you have been popping all the soap bubbles of life that can't really make us happy. And Lord, as you popped each one of them, it hurt as we released our fingers on that. But God, we thank you that now you've shown us the secret to enjoying life. That the secret to enjoying life is not about any of the ingredients in this life. It's about you. And so God, I pray for all of us, Lord. If there's anyone in here who has not placed their faith in Jesus and has not begun the journey of starting to see life from your perspective, then Lord, I pray that you will help them to do that tonight. God, for those of us who have believed in you, then Lord, I pray that we will keep our eyes focused on the perspective that comes from knowing you. And God, we thank you that you do want us to enjoy life. We thank you, Lord, that the things we do do actually matter. But Lord, we know that in order to really enjoy life, we first have to have a relationship with you. And so God, help all of us to enjoy you and the gifts that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.